Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's FedSoc Forum. Today, February 7th, 2024, we are excited to present Henry Kissinger and International Law. My name is Jack Apizzi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups of the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Professor Thomas Schwartz, a distinguished professor of history and a professor of political science and European studies and a director of undergraduate studies at Vanderbilt University. He is also the author of Henry Kissinger and American Power. We are also joined by Professor Jeremy Surrey, who is the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership and Global Affairs and a professor of public affairs and history at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also the author of Henry Kissinger and the American Century, and he is the host of the This is Democracy podcast. Our moderator today is Professor John Yu, who is the Emanuel S. Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for any questions you might have. If you have a question at any point, please just type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle those as we can towards the end of the program. With that, thank you all very much for being with us today. Professor Yu, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thanks, Jack, and thanks to the Federal Society for organizing this important forum. And also, I really want to thank our two guests, uh, Professor Thomas Schwartz, Professor Jeremy Surrey from uh, Vanderbilt and University of Texas. Um, I'm just going to play a moderator role. Uh, each uh, speaker will have about 10 to 15 minutes to discuss the issue before us about Henry Kissinger, uh, international politics, international law. Then we'll have some time set aside for them to respond uh, to each other. And then uh, about 20 minutes, I hope, for questions uh, from all of you using the chat function, which I'll uh, read off. Um, just in the interest of full disclosure, uh, Tom Schwartz was a professor of mine in college, and he gave me the important advice, don't go to graduate school, get a law degree. <laughs> I I think the law may be worse off for his advice, but it was certainly better for me. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, my heart of hearts, I would love to have done what Tom and Jeremy do for a living. And I just want to say that because I think this is uh, great that the Federal Society is inviting non-law speakers, people who we think of as the real experts about the facts, when we then make legal arguments about against that. And I hope we are going to do a lot more of this in the future. And I can't think of better topic and better speakers than two prime diplomatic historians talking about Kissinger. So uh, we did the coin toss in the beginning and Jeremy lost. So he goes first. And Tom has asked to receive in the second half. <laughs> Jeremy, why don't you begin? Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your uh, very kind introduction. Thank you to the Federalist Society for organizing this. Thank you to all the people who have uh, given time to uh, be a part of our discussion. Most of all, I want to thank my friend Tom Schwartz uh, for doing this uh, with me. Um, Tom was not ever formally my teacher, but I sort of feel like he's one of the um, great figures in our field who's always been uh, a mentor and a friend uh, to me. I've known him since I was in graduate school. And uh, it's really a pleasure to do anything with Tom. And, and I'm delighted that both he and I have tried to make sense of the, the, what one cannot really make sense of, which is the brain of Henry Kissinger. Uh, it is so sui generis. And even at 100, it was still uh, a machine without parallel. And uh, I'm delighted that we have a chance to talk about this today, particularly the topic of international law, because I think this is one of many areas, uh, but certainly one of the key areas where Kissinger is often misunderstood. The standard thing you'll hear from polemicists and, and, and from some scholars who maybe haven't approached things with the depth that, that, that Tom and I have, um, they'll say that he didn't care about international law, that this, he was this sort of quintessential Machiavellian figure who, of course, the, the term Machiavelli, Machiavellian doesn't even reflect Machiavelli's thinking, ends justify the means, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's way off base. There are many things perhaps to criticize in the way Kissinger conceptualized and implemented his ideas about international law. But there's no doubt that he came out of, from the very beginning, a tradition seeped in thinking about international law. One of the main points of my book, uh, which is as much an intellectual history as it is a diplomatic history, Tom's book is wonderful in its detailed analysis of a lot of Kissinger's policymaking. My book is trying to understand where Kissinger comes from. 
uh, one of the central points of my book is that he really is the figure in American policymaking who brings late 19th century German intellectual thought into the world of American policy. The most important figures in his intellectual development were figures like Carl Friedrich, Hans Morgenthau, Oswald Spengler, to some extent Carl Schmitt. Uh, and he thinks of the world, and this is where there's a tension between his thinking and a Wilsonian American discourse. He has trouble thinking of the world in ways that are built around democracy and liberalism. He thinks much more in terms of German thought from the late 19th century. How would I characterize that? A world that is built around hierarchy, a world that is built around Bildung, notions of particular ideas having precedence over others. Culture and law are one and the same for Kissinger, as they were for most 19th century German thinkers. And power is culturally defined, but it is culture not in a democratic vector. It is culture in a hierarchical, meritocratic vector, and one that reflects what he sees as large conglomerations of cultural, political, and military achievement. Uh, and, and this, by the way, is one of the reasons I think he was drawn to China from a very early period. There's no doubt that Richard Nixon also was drawn to China for his own reasons. But Kissinger, I think, although not an expert on China, certainly early in his career, quite naturally sought China as the Germany of Asia. And I think in some moments he thought of Persia and Iran as the Germany of the Middle East, right? These long-standing cultures of power, these long-standing nodes of achievement uh, and, and intellectual civilizational accomplishment. And that's a very 19th century German way uh, of thinking. From Carl Friedrich, who was one of Kissinger's most important intellectual teachers at Harvard and thereafter, from Friedrich he learned, I think, a conception of international law that was really built around rules, norms, and federalism, but federalism not in an American sense. Uh, it was to be a world where there were rules, uh, unlike Hedley Bull and others uh, who are of a similar generation, he did not see anarchy in the world, Kissinger. He saw oligopoly. He saw large entities vying for power uh, and, of course, the role of many other smaller entities in that larger ecosystem. It was an ecosystem that was oligopolist where many of the smaller actors played an important role as coalition builders. Kissinger is really one of the first Americans to make the case that multipolarity is better than bipolarity for this reason, right? The standard way of thinking about the Cold War from George Kennan forward was a world that was bipolar. Kissinger always thought of it as multipolar. He always thought of it in this great power context of the 19th century. So international law served a set of needs. This is what he gets from Friedrich, I think. Rules of the game, things you do and things you don't do, norms, and they fundamentally serve to create order, to preserve order. And I think some people have taken the Spenglerian influences on Kissinger too far, but they're definitely there. He's definitely a declinist. He's def definitely one who sees that an international system that's unregulated, that doesn't have some kind of legal authority, is an international system that will careen to disaster, which is, of course, his explanation for World War I, which was a standard explanation uh, at the time. International rules are designed to mediate conflict. They're designed to arbitrate conflict, and they're designed to provide predictability so leaders don't make mistakes. Uh, within that context, within that context, international law for Kissinger was not democratic, and it was not judicial. It was enforced by the largest actors. Again, this is a very 19th century German way of thinking about this, that the law overlaps with the responsibility of the largest actors in that. Much of Kissinger's career, I think, can be defined as his efforts to educate Americans on what he thought was their role in the world as enforcers of a certain set of norms, a certain order in the world that, of course, would serve American interests, but would serve the interests of other countries as well. And I think this is one of the many reasons toward the end of his life, while he was so alarmed by the belligerent, conflictual framing of U.S.-China relations. Because for Kissinger, the future of Asia was to be a regulated, legally managed world order in Asia where the United States and China were the first among equals and able to manage relationships in that, in that context. This is why he liked the European Union. People forget he was an advocate of the European Union. He's infamously quoted for saying that there was no one in charge of the European Union, but that was the whole point for him. 
It was to be a coalition, a federalist coalition of states that would manage law and order within this part of the world and would work very well for that, for that purpose for him. So international law was to be made and forced by the largest states, by the states that were the highest achieving. And they were to see responsibility that they had for smaller states as well, as smaller states were to see responsibilities toward them. The states for Kissinger in his model of international law are the receptacles of power, but the real sources of legitimacy, and he writes about legitimacy quite a lot, especially from his dissertation forward, the sources of legitimacy were cultural. Why was it that the United States had a role to play in the world? It wasn't simply because we were a powerful country, a rich country. It was because we were a center of cultural production. We were a center of achievement. And, and this is why Kissinger's uh, international legal theory, th theorizing and thinking can look racist and culturally condescending to some. Because it is culturally condescending, because it, it is built around the notion that all cultures are not equal. It is built around the notion that all civilizations uh, are not equal. Uh, and it's not an on or off switch either. It's a very hierarchical uh, world. And, and again, it's come on, someone coming from his intellectual tradition, that should not be surprising to us at all. Hans Morgenthau thought of the world they were. In fact, most of the emigre intellectuals, including Hannah Arendt, if you push them, would think about the world uh, in these terms. And it meant that military power was actually not the end all be all. For Kissinger, diplomacy was the place where culture and military power came together. And, and I think that's the best way to understand so many of his diplomatic initiatives, whether we're talking about China, or we're talking about detente, or we're talking about shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East, which of course has taken on a new relevance uh, recently, right? Uh, Tony Blinken is kind of trying to recreate this. Uh, for Kissinger, Egypt uh, played a particularly important role, not simply because it was a powerful neighbor to Israel, but because it was a legitimate center of cultural power. Kissinger agreed with Sadat that Egypt was the rightful cultural center for at least one main part of the Arab world. And Kissinger had no time for Palestinians because he saw them as not culturally significant. Uh, whether that's right or wrong, we can debate. But that's how he saw the world. And I think the power of his vision was he was able to effectuate based on a clairvoyant understanding, a mapping of the world uh, in, in this way. I just wanted to say a couple of other things about the application then uh, of international law. Kissinger was skeptical of international institutions. He was skeptical of those international institutions because he believed they would be hijacked by one of his overriding fears, which was populism. Uh, and I wanted to tell one story, one story. Uh, which is that years ago, uh, we were at a dinner. It, uh, this was a dinner with the New York Historical Society. Uh, it was when my book had come out. And at that point, he was happy with the book. Later, he wasn't. Uh, I should be clear on that. Uh, but we were sitting at dinner, and this was uh, 2008, uh, in the spring of 2008. And it, it just looked like uh, candidate Barack Obama was going to seal up the Democratic nomination. And I said to, to Dr. Kissinger, I said, you know, I, I've gone to a few rallies. I was then at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I was on the faculty there. I was like, I'm, I'm excited, regardless of what you think about Obama, I'm excited that so many young people are excited. I'm glad to see. And, and he said to me, and I think it was a very honest uh, moment, he said, you know, um, when I see large numbers of people excited at rallies, I'm not sure that's what we want in our politics. I'm not sure that's the politics we want. Uh, that applies to his view of domestic politics, by the way. I don't think he was opposed to civil rights, but he was never a civil rights marcher, even though many of his many Jews of his generation were. But I think it also applies to his understanding of international institutions, because he had witnessed the United Nations, in a sense, get get captured, get uh, perhaps overtaken uh, by a kind of populism, and he was fearful that other institutions would fall that way. International law was to be implemented by the most capable powers and by the leaders of the most capable powers. He was explicitly elitist. Uh, about this. We don't have to like it, uh, but we have to recognize it and recognize the power of that vision. I think it allowed him to effectuate change. It allowed him to do things. It was also a world that was federalist in Carl Friedrich's thinking, which is to say nested levels of authority. The United States was to have primary influence in its own area, in its own country, in its own continent, but then secondary influence 
in a transatlantic space, tertiary influence thereon. It was a world of nested sovereignties. I spend a lot of time trying, trying to explain to my students, I don't think I have to explain to this audience, that sovereignty is not an all or nothing. There are different degrees of sovereignty. And for him, the world was one of different levels, different concentric circles of sovereignty. The United States perhaps having the largest piece, but having limitations as well as many levels to its sovereignty. And then the final point uh, was that his notion of international law was not to be subjected to elections. Uh, he was skeptical. Uh, and I've come to agree with him more and more over time that elections actually produce um, the kinds of leadership and serious thinking that we would hope to see. Uh, I, I guess another way of putting that is uh, he anticipated all the problems of crowdsourcing very early on. For him, international law was to have its own international standing. It was to be recognized as a discipline, as a way of thinking, and people were to be educated into it. Uh, there's a platonic element uh, to this. It wasn't to be static, but it wasn't to be a popularity contest as well. And this is why time and again the criticisms of the unpopularity of some of his policies actually didn't shatter his confidence. It actually reinforced uh, much, much of his thinking uh, on that. Uh, just a final word. I've, I've talked for about uh, 12, 13 minutes. Uh, just a final word I wanted to, to say is I don't think we have to buy his vision of international law wholly or even um, mostly, but I think there are a lot of uh, insights into it. And the one I just take away most today when I look at places like the Middle East or I look at Ukraine are the perils of trying to build international law without the strong buy-in of the most powerful actors. Whether, whether we agree normatively as to whether that should be true or not doesn't really matter. I think the historical record, I'm guessing Tom will agree, is that it's, whether we want to or not, great powers have to be at the center of international law. There have to be laws and rules, and the great powers have to be key actors. We as a country have to recognize that and convince ourselves of that. I think it's atrocious that we're considering abandoning the Ukrainians. That's just my view, and I think Kissinger would find that atrocious uh, as well. Uh, but we also have to get the buy-in from other countries, and we have to do work to build a system, not of international intervention in Ukraine, but of consensus, law, and the enforcement of that law by the most powerful actors in the way that's most effective. So uh, I, will, I will leave it there. Uh, Tom, to you. Well, the interests are wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. And we're going to turn over to Professor Schwartz. Just a short comment. Uh, Jeremy's remarks make me think that if he could have, Kissinger would have claimed co-authorship of the Federalist Papers, too, <laughs> because a lot of the first he thought he wrote all the great ideas in our time. But more importantly, a lot of things that uh, Jeremy say really uh, sort of echo or resound from themes in the Federalist Papers, which uh, a lot of people in the audience, of course, read and are very familiar with. But that was that was wonderful. Uh, Professor Schwartz, please. Oh, well, um, after that, I, I, I really uh, uh, what Jeremy has, has provided a really uh, extraordinary uh, um, understanding for Kissinger and international law that I, I had a problem initially with our even the subject, because uh, not that I dismissed his ideas in international law, it's just that it's not something that I found him very engaged in as a policymaker. And it was a little hard for me to conceptualize what I wanted to say about it in that uh, case. The other thing was uh, that I was thinking um, as this forum was developed, I was thinking of all the accusations against Kissinger, namely for violating international law, for being, in effect, what Rolling Stone and what many on the left in the United States called a war criminal uh, after his death. And anyone who followed the reactions uh, of some after his death recognizes that he was accused constantly of all sorts of crimes against international law in that period. And I wanted to, in a sense, say a little bit about that as well in, in the course of this. And Recognizing, I think, I think um, Jeremy's uh, sense of, of Kissinger's intellectual history is one that I share. His book was very fundamental in my thinking about uh, thinking about Kissinger's background. But here's where I, I I was thinking the book. My book originated in the concept or the idea of using Kissinger's biography to talk in some manner about uh, the history of American foreign relations. To use biography as a lens through which uh, to see what I called at that time the dilemmas of American power. In a way, it was uh, the, the initial spur for the uh, book series was this notion of teaching history through biography. 
which has its problems, but also is very effective. So student, I, I think in general, people respond to biography much better than they do to more abstract historical works. Um, and I, um, I saw Kissinger's biography particularly as encapsulating the rise of America as to its great power status, and then to Kissinger's own exercise of power as both national security advisor, then secretary of state, and, and for a period of time as secretary of state, almost as president for foreign policy. Uh, Kissinger's life, of course, from his birth in Germany, his emigration after the Nazis came to power, then his return in the form of an American occupation regime, uh, and his ascendancy through um, what Jeremy called, well, a Cold War university, Harvard University at that time, is a pretty remarkable story. And it does capture aspects of the American uh, uh, century, the American uh, uh, period of, uh, of power in the 20th century. Um, but my book really, in terms of any um, contribution intellectually, starts with Kissinger coming to be Richard Nixon's national security advisor in 1969. Um, this was a post that I argue in my book which Richard Nixon wanted. He recognized in Henry Kissinger an extraordinary talent in both bureaucratic maneuvering and, and power uh, and understanding how to make uh, the bureaucracy work. Um, he wanted to use Kissinger as national security advisor to bring foreign policy making into the White House to also ensure that the foreign policy decisions and particular innovations of the Nixon administration would redound to his political credit. Uh, that the, his re-election as president was one of his foremost objectives from the very moment he became president. And he saw, particularly in changing American foreign policy, in moving away from what might have, one might uh, argue was the Kennedy uh, pay, pay any price, bear any burden uh, uh, view of American leadership to one which did retrench American power, but did it in a creative way in which kept the United States as an important player in the international system. And uh, in that sense, Kissinger was, although he had his own ideas, he also was um, the, uh, he worked with Richard Nixon and Richard Nixon had certain objectives. Um, and fundamental to my book is a take on uh, Henry Kissinger uh, that is a little different from what others wrote before me in, in terms of stressing uh, others other historians did stress more Kissinger's ideas, his, his role as a theorist, the background of his ideas, particularly his embrace of what's called realpolitik, the German word for approaching foreign policy uh, with an emphasis on states protecting and furthering the national interests, largely devoid of ideology or uh, moral considerations. My emphasis was on Kissinger as a, polit a political figure, a politician someone who recognized how significant domestic politics were in carrying out foreign policy, and who worked to facilitate that both for President Nixon and ultimately for President Ford as well, seeing in foreign policy very much an aspect of the domestic battles in the United States of a way to um, help um, his political uh, masters, his political, uh, the, those who he worked for. Um, there was a moment, I think, when Kissinger himself sort of uh, there's a, the, uh, uh, I don't have any, I don't have many good stories. I only met with Kissinger once for an interview. I, he was not particularly thrilled with the idea of my book. Um, as he said, when I told him I was going to write something short, he said, you will leave things out. And so I, I knew that, but he was kind in other respects. And um, particularly uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 references I found that I, I, I tell in my book is when uh, he was discussing the Middle East, uh, an area where he played a particularly crucial role and uh, wanted to be shaping policy. And he was annoyed with Nixon. And he made a remark about that damn constitutional amendment that he wanted the Republicans to push through to let a foreign born person become president of the United States. So he had his own, own visions at times. Um, he did serve Nixon um, in particular ways. And, and I think here goes to the um, what I had um, uh, thought about with international law, namely to many of the accusations against him. Um, Christopher Hitchens, who was really most responsible in the work, the trial of Henry Kissinger, argued that there were three fundamental areas where Kissinger could be seen as a war criminal or be, be brought before international law. One was in the bombing of Cambodia. The second was in the overturning of the Chilean uh, government of Salvador Allende. And the third was in 
the support given to General Suharto in suppressing the East Timor Rebellion um, in uh, 1975. In terms of the Vietnam War, Kissinger did obviously come in, I think, skeptical of the war, uh, believing though it needed to be ended in a manner that somehow preserved American credibility, which was also something Richard Nixon believed. Nixon believed that he could end the war in a manner that Eisenhower had ended the Korean War, could preserve a independent South Vietnam. Um, he wanted to go beyond, he wanted to demonstrate to the North Vietnamese that he would go beyond the tactics that were used by the Johnson administration. And so one of those was to bomb North Vietnamese installations in Cambodia, which he did with fervor, and which Kissinger thought was also a very important step in trying to lead to a settlement in Vietnam. Um, Kissinger at this time was also trying to further Nixon's so-called madman theory by meeting with the Russian ambassador and, and suggesting that Kiss Nixon might have lost his mind if he, if he can't end the Vietnam War. Um, Jeremy has written about the nuclear alert that Kissinger or Nixon uh, launched in October of 69. So there, there were all these attempts to end the war, frustrated by the fact Tenoy would not go along with it. Um, and in fact, um, the expansion of the war and the uh, Cambodian bombing, I think, is part of that. Um, to the extent that uh, Cambodia was a part of the Vietnam War, I think any indictment of, of Henry Kissinger has to recognize that the war was a product of many American administrations and leaders, and that singling him out for the role on, on the bombing of Cambodia is, I think, uh, misguided and, and, and overwhelmingly, um, I think, misses the degree to which this was part of a larger conflict that American leaders had launched um, with, in terms of the containment policy and the prevention of communist expansion that had been the theme of American foreign policy since 1945. Um, on the Chilean case, I think there, I am more critical, but I think that Chile represented particularly the sensitivity of Richard Nixon uh, to communism in Latin America, something that he had seen in the Cuban case and had been very sensitive to, and that he was particularly determined to get the CIA involved in. Uh, Kissinger, again, served as the point man for this. I don't think he cared a great deal about Chile at all, uh, but he did further um, covert activities that were designed to prevent Allende from coming to power, one of which resulted in the death of General René Schneider in Chile. Um, I think in this case, uh, I think we can be very critical of the administration for attempting this, since I think it was uh, an overreaction uh, to the Chilean uh, situation, but I don't think it amounts to a criminal indictment. And even in an East Timor, uh, which I think the United States uh, really largely lacked uh, the ability to really uh, control what the Indonesian government would do, um, and also was in a position where Southeast Asia had been so weakened uh, by uh, or the stance of the United States had been so weakened by the collapse in Vietnam that it was very unlikely that the United States was going to take a strong stance against one of its remaining allies in Indonesia. And that was something I think both Ford and Nixon uh, were well, agreed on. Uh, there are many other aspects. There are other aspects of Kissinger's misjudgments um, on the Indo-Pakistan war, also because of an obsession, I think, with China. There were achievements, though, and I think uh, one cannot underestimate. And I think one of the things I tried to do in my biography is try to come to some sort of a balanced judgment on Henry Kissinger. And I think on the Middle East, he played an extraordinary role in setting up at least the beginnings of a peaceful framework in the Middle East. Uh, obviously, that looks a lot further away now than it did uh, maybe even a few months ago when it looked like Saudi Arabia and, and Israel were going to make an agreement. But nevertheless, Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy during that period with both Egypt and Syria was uh, a, uh, I think, a, a major achievement for American diplomacy during this period. Um, his detente with the Soviet Union, uh, despite the criticisms, I think later, uh, was also necessary given American public opinion. And I think it was conducted in a manner that uh, recognized uh, the responsibility of both nuclear powers to being uh, particularly responsible or careful about the dangers of nuclear escalation. And uh, I do think Henry Kissinger, and I, I'm gonna tell a story here from a, a friend who recently passed away, Ambassador John Kornblum, who was here at Vanderbilt. He worked for Kissinger during this period and remembered uh, prevent, presenting Kissinger with a uh, suggestion on the human rights policy in 1975, which Kissinger rejected. Kissinger in that sense 
rejected the idea that human rights had to attain a higher priority in American foreign policy. And Kornblum always felt that Kissinger and Niskens um, had become too stubborn and had, had become blinded and missed the domestic political salience of human rights at this point. And this was one of his mistakes toward the end of his time in office. And that uh, he later, of course, became more sensitive and uh, was, of course, much more willing uh, to talk about human rights, even though in many respects, he uh, 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 certainly did not value it in the same manner uh, as others in international politics. In his early career, Kissinger often referenced the Greek goddess Nemesis, um, which defeated man by fulfilling his wishes in a different form or answering his prayers too completely. I think Kissinger, who became such a celebrity and who personalized his own foreign policy, got his prayers answered too completely in the sense that he came to be seen as responsible particularly in a moral sense, for many policies and actions over which he had relatively little influence or control. And I think, uh, to borrow from Jeremy's uh, reference to legitimacy, I think, in, in a sense, Kissinger, uh, Kissinger did worry about the legitimacy of the international system. He was concerned about foreign, about the policies of countries like Iran with their uh, revolutionary uh, nature and, of course, of the Soviet Union uh, early in the Cold War and later in China. Um, and did hope, in some sense, to achieve a certain stability in international affairs that would prevent the uh, possibility of either nuclear war or serious uh, international warfare. Uh, but I think, in that sense, um, he uh, was not as uh, he 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 had that skepticism toward international institutions and international law that Jeremy's referenced, and uh, in a way became uh, targeted as responsible um, for. Uh, policies adopted by the United States government that over which some of which it were which he had influence, but over uh, a period of time uh, that made uh, his own uh, uh, the the reference or the reaction to, for example, his passing to be as polarized as it was, uh, and the accusations to be as extreme as they were over his conduct of American foreign policy. So I'll stop there. Maybe we can have a discussion. Thank you, Tom, and that was uh, wonderful. Both of you remind me how much better it is to be a professor in the arts and sciences where you can talk about nemesis and you don't have to drop a footnote to explain who that is <laughs> to our viewers, though. I, I love it. I love it. So, uh, Jeremy, uh, maybe you could take a few minutes to comment on anything um, you heard from Professor Schwartz. Particularly, he went through, um, you know, the famous Christopher Hitchens indictment of uh, Kissinger, which I don't think you, could, you almost got to but didn't quite get to. Um, and then maybe uh, in about seven or eight minutes, we'll turn to questions. We have a lot of them. They're very, I mean, <laughs> I'm looking at them now, very educated and uh, thorough, quite deep questions. So please uh, send them in. We'll get to as many as you can. Oh, oh by the way, use the Q&A function, not the webinar chat function. Thank you, everybody. Jeremy. So uh, that was fantastic, Tom. I always learn uh, so much from your writing and from your, your presentations. And, and I think you have really brought out better than anyone else, as you say, Kissinger as politician, uh, as someone who really understood, I think in his his terms, that, that power is political. I mean, this, he was a, a, a student of Clausewitz. He had lived that in World War II, that you can't have power, you can't get things done if you cannot play to the egos, interests, and concerns of various actors. That applies to the international space as well as uh, the, the domestic space. I mean, what, what fascinates me, I have no disagreement with anything you've said. What fascinates me, though, is uh, as a political actor, how tone deaf he could sometimes be to the criticisms uh, that, that he faced. Uh, you know, uh, our, our mutual colleague, John Gaddis, who we both have enormous respect for, writes very positively about Kissinger's Heartland speeches in 75 and 76 when he goes around the country he goes to minnesota he goes to cleveland and he tries to convince people you know that there's a moral vision there and and i think these speeches go over like a lead balloon uh you know in the 76 election as as we all know his name becomes almost a curse word kissinger says ford has to pretend he doesn't know him and so i guess it, it's just a question tom and we've actually talked about this before but i love would love to hear you reflect on how could someone who was so politically astute at working in the lion's den of Richard Nixon's White House and survive Watergate as almost no one else did, how could he be so tone deaf to other politics around him? Well, I think I think he he did get more isolated um, as he as his both power and celebrity increased, so that he didn't 
uh, early on, he was, you know, he talked a lot with um, Democrats. He talked a lot. He had a lot of friends among journalists um, in the establishment, in the Washington Post, New York Times group. And I think that uh, those sorts of relationships benefited him a great deal in the early period of his ascendancy. But as he became more powerful, I think, and as particularly the conservative wing of the Republican Party began to coalesce and be concerned about excessively um, appeasing the Soviet Union, I think he became uh, less, he, 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 those people were not in his group. Those were not the people he was talking to. And I think he became somewhat uh, tone deaf to them. I mean, the, the Democrats and human rights uh, in some ways, I mean, he was very good with people like Fulbright. He had a harder time with the McGoverns and, and others. Um, he, he could deal with people who were concerned about American power being overextended, but not with people who were concerned about whether we were freeing political dissidents um, or um, pushing authoritarian regimes to be more liberal. So I, I think there may be a there may be an element in there of uh, a degree to which he became or he listened to his press clippings more than he um, dealt with opposition, um, even though he always always had a, a, a there was always this thing Walter Isaacson commented in his biography that the way to get Kissinger's attention was to write something critical about him and then he'd call you up or something. But I I think um, he did become a, a bit clueless. Brent Scowcroft, who I did have a chance to talk with, said that he thought Kissinger really never really connected with a lot of the more conservative Republicans um, uh, that were developing around Ronald Reagan and others in 76 and that. Now, he 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 made a an effort afterwards to sort of catch up with that, and he, he did his best to try and uh, um, get into the Reagan circle, but it, he never was trusted by them, and, and that uh, that always kept him, I think, from having the type of influence he wanted to. He wanted to come back as Secretary of State. He wanted to come back yeah. and never did. And uh, that is uh, actually one of the interesting stories as well about his career. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I'd add, Tom, to that ex excellent explanation is, you know, I think one of the things his career warns us about, and I think you implied this in your answer, is the hubris and self-centeredness of power, even for someone who I think is as self-conscious about it as he is. I do think, just as you said, and I think you show this so well in your book, and I recommend it to, to everyone, um, is that he, he does change over time. And the accretion of power, and particularly during Watergate, I think the absence of the president, I think, I think it does, not necessarily in a legally corrupting, but in a morally corrupting way, in an intellectually corrupting way. And I think, it, I think, he, I, I think he loses perspective, and then I think his hunger for power thereafter almost does a disservice to some of his thinking uh, before. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I think when you see how much he alienated Congress um, after the 74 elections and really had a hard time dealing with congressional uh, leaders, um, even though he had a number of them who were his allies or would have been his allies, um, I do think I do think it became harder for him to accept the type of critique they were offering. He thought they had done a great job, and now these people were coming after him on all the things that they had accomplished. He felt, you know, the the relationship with the Soviet Union, which so many uh, had been so concerned with when they started, were in power, and now it was more balanced, and suddenly everyone was criticizing him for it or the SALT agreements, these sorts of things. So I think he, uh, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly that I think there's a hubris here of being able, unable really to adapt uh, to changing political circumstances in a way. And and Gerald Ford tried to school him on this, but Gerald Ford was always in awe of Henry Kissinger. And so I think even the, that effort did not work as, as it might have, even when he tried gently in some ways to distance himself. Um, I think other people like Rumsfeld and others wanted to fire Kissinger and get rid of him, and and that and uh, Ford always resisted that. Um, so, having uh, had a chance to meet and uh, work with Rumsfeld in his second tour, I can see that as an attitude Rumsfeld had toward a lot of people. <laughs> but let me let me uh, turn to some of these questions. Uh, very interesting, um, and the first one I think this is one a lot of people are asking. Uh, and maybe I think it ties to some of the themes Jeremy raised was, was there something in the way uh, Kissinger's um, career, his way of thinking before he became Secretary of State, did it cause him to miss anything about China today? Um, was he overly optimistic about China? Did he, how did he, did it cause him to miss the turn uh, in relations now between China and the U.S. has gone so frosty? 
And then I think this person might have been in college at Harvard around the Kissinger. He said, did he not learn anything from John Fairbank or Reichauer? It's a Jeremy, that sounds like it's directed at you. Yeah, this question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a and great then, question. Um, I mean, the first thing that has to be said, right, is that McCarthyism had an effect in the United States in the American Academy when Kissinger was there of limiting access to knowledge on China. Uh, this is an, an old argument that was made about explaining American missteps in Vietnam, and I think it's still true, which is we went in without the, the body of knowledge you thought we would have had for that region, because following the McCarthyite period or during the McCarthyite pe period, people like Owen Lattimore and many others who had a lot to offer were, were, were pushed out, especially if they had nice things to say about Mao Zedong. And so even though John Fairbank and Reichshauer were around, they were the exceptions to the rule. Kissinger showed very little interest, as far as I can tell, in China during the 1950s and the early 1960s. I think he came to it late. So it's not that um, he learned the wrong lessons, that he came to it actually with very little knowledge of China. And I think Nixon knew much more about China. Nixon had spent much more time uh, as vice president uh, thinking about China. He had been briefed uh, during the Kamoi Matsui crises and things of that sort. Kissinger was, was, you know, he was around the Council on Foreign Relations. He was around Nelson Rockefeller's group. But at Harvard, I don't think he was really doing much with regard uh, to China. And I think that's why China fell into this template, this model for him of a great civilization, the Germany of Asia, a civilization that had existed for centuries. And um, he also believed um, that China recognized that its foremost adversary by the late 60s and early 70s was the Soviet Union, not the United States. They were involved in a shooting war. Uh, and in 1969, there was even talk of that war going beyond just a, a border skirmish. And uh, he recognized and was getting briefings on that to a level that most Americans weren't. So the combination of his, shall we say, schematic view of China and then um, the intelligence he was getting on the border conflict, that really colored his, his view. It, it's extraordinary, though, the, the leap that he and Nixon make uh, in, in reaching out to China. Uh, on the one hand, you can say it shows their perspicacity and their courage. On the other hand, it can show their flagrant, reckless behavior. I mean, it's the only time I know, John, where a president goes in 72 to a foreign country without a pre-arranged agenda. You know, when, when the president comes to Austin, he has a pre-arranged agenda for every minute, right? They, they go to China. They don't even know they're going to get the meeting uh, with Mao. They, they take a lot of risks, and I think that reflects the combination of strategic planning and strategic hope with detailed ignorance that they bring that they bring to the table. They rolled the dice and it happened to work out well, at least in that time. Can I add, I think um, also though, that you can't underestimate the domestic political uh, importance of China. China reversed the polls for a time. It was a popular move to embrace China in 1971. Very, very popular. And uh, Nixon and Kissinger saw this as a, or Nixon more maybe than Kissinger, but Kissinger too. I mean, the the elaborate uh, coverage of the China visit that uh, the, the the polling afterwards showing that you know almost every American knew about Nixon going to China, uh, the whole idea that only Nixon could go to China, all of that was really quite an important thing, and I think it had a real impact on Kissinger in terms of his thinking too about the significance of China. He tells a British diplomat in 1973 that China is our best NATO ally. I mean, he he was he was enthusiastic. Yes, we could say some ignorance there, but I think in the tactical terms of the Cold War and the politics of the time, it looked great. Now we have a different perspective on China, but I think we have to keep in mind what what happened that, at that time or what were the conditions were. Um, I'm pulling together two questions here, which have a very similar theme. There is not surprising you have a lot of international lawyers listening in. They're very uh, curious about what both of you said about Kissinger's skeptical attitude towards international organizations. Uh, and want to ask more about why was that? And so they, uh, you have two here. One, um, uh, they just these are just examples they feel of international organizations uh, that Kissinger was very skeptical of. But they're inviting your broader ideas. Why? Did Kissinger have such skepticism? So one is the World Trade Organization. Uh, you know, so this person writes, would Kissinger actually be happy with the way uh, the Biden and Trump administrations have been so 
uh, almost hostile to the WTO and this sort of return of sanc uh, trade sanctions, tariffs, uh, lack of respect for the WTO as a body. And then they say also uh, Kissinger's attitude, of course, personally driven in some way towards the International Criminal Court and his worry, his own personal worry of uh, being uh, you know, indicted and tried by the ICC. But is it personal, this resistance towards international organizations? Is it, Jeremy was suggesting earlier, it's no, it's really part of his broader approach to thinking. Um, some of this is, I guess, is how much of it was skepticism driven while he was Secretary of State, and how much is it driven by what he thinks after he's Secretary of State towards IOs? Uh, Jeremy, why don't you go ahead? I think you, sure. you raised the issue first. Sure, sure. Uh, and I think it's both, right, to the latter part of your question. Um, I think there's a longstanding skepticism, an articulate skepticism, a learned skepticism about international organizations that he has. He's not opposed to them, but he sees them playing a, a minor role supporting the work of the great powers, right? They are to support the world work of the great powers. They are not to supersede that. And I think that's where the difference really comes in because the claim that some make through the ICC, and I think it's also a, a well-formulated claim, is that the ICC in some ways, I think Article 98, right, in some cases would give the ICC the ability to supersede the, the cr criminal trial of Slobodan Milosevic being an example perhaps of, of this. So he, he was skeptical of that. He was not skeptical of the existing of, existence of international organizations. You mentioned the WTO. He actually supported Chinese entrance into the WTO. I, if I remember correctly, I think he was at the White House when Clinton announced that, yes. uh, supportive of a Democratic president bringing China into the WTO, supportive of the idea that this would make China, uh, what was it, a responsible stakeholder, I think is the, the phraseology that was, that was used at the time. Kissinger's skepticism about international organizations was he didn't believe, number one, that they would ever have the power or the cultural capital that the great powers would have. And second, he believed that they could be captured and would be captured often by other actors, that they, 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 they would have the problems of regulatory capture uh, in, in their elements. And he, have, he had seen that in the General Assembly. He had witnessed how the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, had been transformed around so many issues because of the changing composition of the General uh, Assembly. Um, and so he believed that the organization should be subsumed within this federal structure. And later, when these organizations, particularly the ICC, went after him, it was very personal. Um, he, he felt, I think, not only that he was being disrespected, uh, he felt he was being constrained from doing the good work he should still be doing. And we should recognize it had an effect. Um, there were parts of the world he couldn't travel to. He had to be careful when he moved in different areas. Uh, so no one should deny that, that this was personal. It would just be improper to say that it didn't have a true intellectual foundation to it as well. I uh, would add that he did see a relationship between politics and economics that, for example, on the when the Europeans came down hard on uh, the Middle East, uh, opposing some of his policies, he was not shy about going after the European Union and, and working toward and saying, look, you guys are getting uh, our protection and yet, you know, you're, you're, you're doing things economically against us and you're opposing us in policy. So he had, he, he had a respect for the institutions and even in the United Nations, he, I mean, he deeply disliked the, the passage of the resolution comparing Zionism to racism, but at the same time, he didn't want Moynihan to, 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 to uh, damage the U.S. Uh, role, role in the UN. So he, 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 he was ambivalent sometimes about how he wanted to treat international organizations. But I'd largely agree with Jeremy that he saw uh, that, you know, they, they, they had, they played a role, but they were not, uh, they, they did not have the power to really be decisive in this manner. There are a series of questions. Um, it's almost like these questions wish Kissinger was, an, was around as an AI and we could just ask him questions about what to do now. So let me, let me, I could put it to you maybe this way. It is, I mean, it's kind of like what you were both saying because of his complex mind and his importance, but um, we've got a lot of foreign policy challenges going on right now. Um, maybe each of you could pick one and explain what would Kissinger think we should do? I mean, obviously there are questions about Ukraine, Gaza, China. I mean, unfortunately these days you could go on and on, uh, Russia, uh, maybe because there's so many questions of this nature. I would just say maybe each of you could pick one of these hotspot problems we have right now 
And what would Kissinger say? What would Kissinger recommend we do? Maybe you could pick one um, where Kissinger's views might be the most different from what we are doing today. Uh, maybe that would be interesting. But uh, Tom, why don't you start on that one? What, what is it that, uh, sorry to stick you with all the hard one, but you well, know, no, I, you know, I have been thinking today, about this. Think Kissinger? Yeah, please. I have been thinking about this a lot in relation to the Middle East, um, and particularly what Tony Blinken has been trying to do by traveling to different countries. You know, there is, I think Kissinger would have been drawn perhaps to the idea that there's possibilities for a breakthrough. I mean, he saw the war in 1973 as opening up possibilities. He might have thought that the Hamas-Israeli uh, war opened up new possibilities, but I think he would have also recognized that it also had certain, it, it created certain problems as well. But I think, I think particularly uh, the idea that uh, there could be some sort of a, a trade-off or settlement here, uh, giving Palestinians greater autonomy or something of resembling a state in return for Saudi Arabian um, uh, recognition of Israel and a role in rebuilding Saudi Arabia and Egypt, say a role in rebuilding Gaza or also helping in the West Bank. So I think he might have th thought that there might be the possibility of arranging something like that as a way of, and then using that as a way of trying to organize a, a coalition against the Iranians who are playing the key role, it seems to me, in, in, in trying to disrupt any type of American vision. He uh, was supportive of the Abraham Accords um, and thought that they were a step forward. You're right, uh, Jeremy's right about his view of the Palestinians, but I think he might have seen, uh, just as he came to see in 73, the importance of Egypt and the um, uh, later the importance of Syria as well as in, in, in negotiating, they might have seen an importance if we could find uh, a, Palestinians were willing to work with um, the uh, Egyptians and Saudis, perhaps, in some sort of a comprehensive settlement. But it, uh, I have thought that uh, Blinken, in, in replicating the sort of travels, is at least trying to do something along those lines. I, again, um, uh, the, the, the great thing that Kissinger had in 1973 that uh, Blinken does not have is that Iran at that time was our ally and was favorably disposed to Israel. Iran's uh, situation now, uh, in many respects, maybe resembles more what the Soviet Union was doing at the time, or at least its concerns and role in that. So uh, I, that, that would be my, my thought that he might have been uh, uh, advising along those lines. Well, I'll go maybe in a surprising direction. I agree with everything that Tom said. Uh, I, I think at the end of his life, and I think if he were still around today, uh, Kissinger would would emphasize his cosmopolitanism. I mean, there's a big theme of my book that this is he is a true cosmopolitan. He is possible because the United States internationalizes. I mean, he when he's a student at Harvard, he's in a Jewish only dorm. Uh, when he becomes Secretary of State, he's the first Jewish Secretary of State. Uh, he really saw. Um, the strength of the United States as an assimilationist vision. It's maybe a, you know, a, an older vision, but a vision I still find compelling of bringing people from different parts of the world together. Uh, and that the United States being a special country for people from different parts of the world. Uh, where am I going with this? I think he'd be appalled at our immigration policies. Um, I think I think Kissinger uh, was a supporter of uh, allowing talented people to come into the United States and become citizens. Uh, what he had experienced in his own family coming in 1938 of opening our institutions to them, uh, he would be he would push back very hard on the isolationist elements, John, that I see in both parties right now. Uh, the notion that you would tie the future security of Europe. Uh, whatever you're doing in Ukraine to the border and that you would hold both ho hold both hostage for political reasons. Uh, I, I, I think that would be a step too far for him. I think he would war warn against us and he would remind us uh, that the American dream is, is a dream of immigration and a dream of supporting free peoples around the world. I, I, I fear too many people in our society have forgotten that, John, and I worry about that. Um, I have to say, just as a moderator, I do share your views on that too, but uh, I'm the moderator. I can't say anything about that. <laughs> uh, uh, to quote uh, my favorite British political sitcom, you might think that I could not possibly comment, which is from <laughs> right House of Cards. House uh, of which, Cards. Uh, yeah, House of Cards. Um, so uh, this is uh, actually, this is a really interesting question from an economist who said, who says, um, economists who study Kissinger 
have criticized him actually for leaving economics out of the way he thought about things that, or tended to downplay economics as a tool of statecraft or would sometimes miss very important economic dimensions of some of the decisions to the point, uh, I guess this person quotes Peter Drucker, a well-known you know, economist who said, uh, quote, Kissinger's refusal to include economics in his plans and policies could, was a blunder of the first magnitude, unquote. Uh, what do you think about that? Did, did Kissinger have sort of a blind spot with economics uh, or did he really think of it, just thought it wasn't this important? Um, is this uh, something that actually you could probably make this criticism of American foreign policy since too, right? But is this, uh, what do you think of this comment uh, from the economics part of the audience? Tom, well, well you go first. Okay, I, uh, you know, he he did downplay it. I think he knew more about it than he, 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 he deliberately in some senses uh, absented himself from a lot of the economic policy making. Uh, one of the most important steps Nixon did in his first term was, of course, breaking the uh, the uh, bond between gold and, and the dollar and, and ending the uh, uh, Bretton Woods system. And uh, this created an enormous disruption with the allies that Kissinger ended up having to play a role in trying to ease over, um, especially John Connolly, who was sort of an early version of Donald Trump in the way he talked about the Europeans and the way he, he discussed these matters. Um, Kissinger did, as Secretary of State, find himself involved with more of the economic issues, uh, food, the food crisis in 1975, and some of the uh, questions of, of the economic, the new, new international economic order, which he uh, sort of finessed in some ways or moved away from. But he was not, I think it, it probably is fair to say that this did not preoccupy him. Uh, I think he felt that he could uh, work with others on that. Um, I think later, as he became an international consultant and, and uh, in his private sector work, he became much more caught up with economic issues, trade issues and the rest. And eventually, I think we may have work that will document that more fully uh, about his career after he was Secretary of State. But that 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 would be my take on that. The, the only thing- Jeremy, two, two minutes before we have to end. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, a short addition to Tom's really thoughtful answer. Uh, and I, I, I wonder if you'll agree, Tom, I think he also in part stayed away from economic policy in the Nixon administration because Nixon was so obsessed with economics and its relationship to his reelection. Um, and so Kissinger was carving out a space for himself, it seemed to me, as the strategic specialist, leaving the economics to Arthur Burns, who is chair of the Federal Reserve, and George Shultz uh, and others. Do you agree with that, Tom? Absolutely. No, I think that's right. He it's it's not as if he didn't. I mean, he 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 dealt with the repercussions from the decisions. He had to deal with the diplomacy of that. But yes, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful discussion. And I'm going to turn the session back over to Jack Capizzi to close. And uh, again, Tom and Jeremy, thank you very much. This was really wonderful. This is the is it fair to say the best time I've ever had on a Federal Society podcast? <laughs> That is high compliment, Jack. John. Thank you. Thanks, well, sir. It, so or no, it's hard to say. <laughs> uh, Jack, please. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I, I certainly agree with what you have to say there. Um, and on behalf of the Federal Society, I just want to extend a thank you to Professor Surrey and Professor Schwartz for being so generous with their time and expertise today. And of course, to you as well, Professor Yu, for moderating. Um, if you'd like to watch a recording of this discussion, it will be made available on YouTube immediately after we're done here today. And then it will be re-uploaded to our website later on. As always, we do welcome listener feedback at info at fed-soc.org. And with that, thank you all very much for being with us today. We are adjourned. Thank you.